So the last time we had a lecture Wednesday, we were talking about essentially how the stress around a wellbore can, and you know, combined with a failure model, can then essentially lead to breakouts and or tensile failures. For the most part, we were focusing on breakouts. Uh, tensile failures occur essentially through hydraulic fracturing uh, of the well, and we're going to talk a lot more about that later in the class and, uh, from both a diagnostics perspective and a stimulation perspective. So for the most part now, we're really just focusing on breakouts. And there's a few, you know, mainly we were just talking about how the in-situ stresses and the pore pressure affect the stress, but there are a couple other things that could affect the stress, and one of those would be the thermal effects, okay? So uh, thermal effects, you know, typically your drilling mud is usually cooler than the usually cooler than the rock. I mean, this is certainly true uh, if you're drilling a geothermal well, but most of the time, uh, even in petroleum reservoirs, your cooling fluid, I mean, your, your drilling mud is going to be a little bit cooler than the rock, and that can lead to some effects. And it turns out that that delta T, that, that uh, it has the same effect. You know, the fact that the, the mud is cooler than the rock has the same effect of increasing the mud weight or pore increasing the mud weight. Okay, so it it ag it actually adds a little bit of stability to the to the well bore. Okay, if you find yourself in the opposite situation, which could happen, where your drilling mud is warmer, then that you know that that that's the same as is sort of an underbalanced scenario. Okay, so it's a the cooling process is a strongly time dependent process. Um, strange. I lost my cursor, my drawing ability. Sorry, let me try something. Oh. Okay. So it's strongly time dependent. It's governed by the heat equation. Uh, a few of you had written even for reservoir simulation. Does that equation look, look familiar? Right. Replace the T's with P's right, for pressure. And it's the pressure diffusivity equation. Right. So this is a Laplacian operator. It's a partial differential equation. Okay, we're not going to solve the equation in this class or anything. You, uh, when you take reservoir simulation, you will, if you haven't had it. Right, you'll just you replace the T's with P's, and you have pressure, and you solve for pressure field. Okay. Uh, diffusion. So this is a diffusion equation essentially. Diffusion is a relatively slow process. It takes a while, um, and uh, but in this case, the the alpha is uh, this should be alpha T. This is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Or and it's in rocks, it's strongly dependent on the silicon content of the rock because silicon or quartz is about an order of magnitude more heat conductive than the typical other materials that are found in the composition of a rock. So highly silicon rocks uh, can diffuse heat quite fast. Um, under steady state conditions, we can, you know, we're not going to solve this equation. Um, there are analytic solutions available. But the nice thing is, and they, they, they turn out to be kind of complicated integral equations, but the nice thing is, uh, well, in fact, the analytic solution is a, is, a, is a series expansion, but if you just keep the first few terms, then you end up with some integral equations, but they turn out in steady state to be just this simple equation right here. So the, the change in the hoop stress associated with any change in temperature is going to be just a function of the coefficient of thermal expansion, the, the Young's modulus, and the Poisson ratio, the material properties. Okay. So, if you sort of look at how this, how this can affect. So, what, what, if you can't read this, this is the, this is the change in, this is the change in the hoop stress at SH max 
as a function of radial position, and this is the normalized radius. So, you know, so one is at the wellbore wall, and two is at two radiuses away, right, from the wellbore wall. And so this is sigma theta theta. The different lines represent different times, so this is actually the solution of the time-dependent problem at one second, 100 seconds, and 1,000 seconds, right? So they all, in long time, converge to this value. Right? So long term, they all converge to that. This is increasing time in this way. Theta, theta, hoop stuff. Sigma, sigma, theta, theta. So that's just the equation from the previous slide. So you can see in this, for this particular problem uh, with a, a delta T of 25 degrees, this is actually 25 degrees cooler, right? So this is, you know, the mud would be 25 degrees cooler than the rock in, the, in this example. Then you get an increase in, uh, this is, so this is a change in the hoop stress of something like, 20, uh, something like 25 MPa, okay? So this is sigma RR here, and the reason we don't, you know, of course there's also a dependence on sigma RR and delta T, but the reason we don't really concern ourselves with it is because it's always zero at the wellbore, and breakouts always occur at the wellbore, right, at the wall. So it's typically what we care about the most, right at the wellbore. And so it doesn't matter. There's no time dependence in sigma RR at the wellbore wall. So there is a time dependence as you move away from the wellbore wall, but there's no. It's always zero at the wellbore wall. So that's why we don't really. So this is sigma RR if you can't read the subscript. So one might then say, okay, well. Can we use the temperature of the drilling mud for stability purposes? Because it, it plays a role like delta P, right? Like the difference in mud weight and pore pressure. Since it plays a similar role, could we use it um, for stability purposes? So if you were in class on Friday, this is the, we solved this. We, you know, I actually re, you know, this is a figure from Zoback's book, which we'll call the reference. And it was also in the slides you know, from last Wednesday, where the, the well, it, yeah, it, it's also the conditions, uh, it's, it's this, okay, yeah. So these are the conditions. These are the conditions to reproduce this a figure, and then when you combine it with a failure model, you can determine the required strength of rock to not have breakouts, and in this case, if you choose a, a, a particular strength, I, I guess some like 75 MPa or something, then you're gonna you can sketch these lines on here as to where the breakouts would occur. Okay, so this is what we'll call so this is what we'll call the reference solution. Okay, and then if we solve the same problem, but we added the temperature dependent term, that 25 degree delta T, then yes, I mean, we have smaller breakout regions. So this is how the stress field were to change just by adding that, that term due to thermal stresses. And so yeah, we, we, we would get a smaller breakout region, okay? And later in this class, we're gonna talk about what it really implies a stable wellbore. But for now, let's just say smaller breakouts are good. It's ultimately going to lead to, to more wellbore stability. Okay, so theoretically, yes, if we could control the, the temperature of the drilling mud, then we could add some stability via that mechanism. The problem is, it's just not really practical. It's not uh, an efficient way to do it because um, the sensitivity of the of the wellbore or the hoop stresses to uh, the temperature are not not as sensitive as they are to delta P. So in other words, it's, it's a much more efficient mechanism to just con control the weight of the, well, of the mud, the weight of the fluid, uh, the mud weight, <coughs> as opposed to the temperature. 
I mean, also it's very hard, right, to to, ch to change the temperature of a lot of drilling mud like that. I mean, it would it would be it's not economical. So in theory, yes, but in practice, we don't really do that. 